Thanks, Matt. Uh, it's my pleasure today to uh, welcome everyone to another exciting edition of the PineNet webinar and to introduce Dr. Charles Conrad. Uh, we call him Chip. He is an associate professor in the Department of Geography at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. They are that sister institution down the road from us who unfortunately does better in basketball, but we, we own the team in football right now. <laughs> Um, Chip and I have been working together for many years through the Southeastern Regional Climate Center. Uh, this is a NOAA-funded effort, and Chip has served as uh, both the deputy director and, over the past three years, the director of the Southeast uh, Regional Climate Center. And he's also been one of the primary contributors to the Southeastern chapter for the National Climate Assessment. Uh, this is a, um, a, a national effort to look at climate impacts across the entire nation and to give guidance for policy um, for the future. Uh, Chip's going to cover a little bit about um, the National Climate Assessment and the work that he's been doing to look at the historical climatology and the projections for climate in the southeast. Um, so with that said, uh, welcome Chip Conrad. All right. Uh, thank you very much, Ryan. Um, I just want to say, before I get started, just give a little quick plug on the Southeast Regional Climate Center. Uh, we're one of uh, six centers scattered out across the country. In the area that we serve, uh, uh, Virginia through the Carolinas, uh, Georgia, Florida, Alabama, and also uh, Puerto Rico. And so we provide climate services for the region. And one thing that, we, that we're really specialized in is taking data, basically climate data, and translating that um, uh, into tools of uh, useful information uh, for people like you. And we have a very close relationship uh, with Ryan. Uh, in, the, in the North Carolina State Climate Office, and so they, they take care of a lot of that uh, for us. Okay, so um, so what I want to do here is give very brief, just a very brief background on the National Climate Assessment, and then I'm going to provide an introduction to the climate of the Southeast uh, through a description of weather uh, and climate extremes. And so in particular, I want to look at the geographic pattern of occurrence of these extremes across the region really focusing on the variability and the trends uh, in these extremes over the last 50 to 100 years. I'll mention, uh, as I go through this, um, societal and public health impacts, and then I'll spend maybe about the last quarter of the presentation looking, uh, looking at some future uh, projections. Okay, so just real quickly, background on the NCA. Um, basically, uh, what they're charged with is providing a report to the President and Congress every four years on the status of climate change science and impacts uh, as specified by the Global Change uh, Research Act of 1990. The last report came out in 2009, and uh, the next one is due to come out in 2013. And that's, uh, that's part of the effort uh, that I'm involved with here right now. And it involves many, many people. Uh, it's a complicated process, and it's one, unfortunately, it's gotten really late in starting, and so we've all been hard at work. Uh, right now, doing a lot of writing. Um, we, we've sort of finished the first round of that, and it's basically uh, going through reviews right now. Uh, the 2013 report is going to have much more of a, an emphasis on impacts, um, especially focusing on adaptation and mitigation strategies. And uh, CERC, the Southeast Regional Climate Center, we're basically uh, been tasked with writing the climate chapter uh, of, the, of the Southeast uh, NCA technical report. And so you can see up there in the top right, uh, just a, a region there, the, the National Climate Assessment Southeast region. That's a little bit different uh, than the region uh, that the uh, Southeast Regional Climate Center has. And as you can really appreciate, this is a, a diverse region, and the climate of Louisiana is markedly different from that in Florida and Virginia. So that's one thing that will come out uh, as, I, uh, as I describe uh, the climate here. Okay, and so... Um, so a lot of what I'm going to show you is information that's gone uh, that, that, that's going into this uh, uh, going into this climate chapter. Okay, so just listing the extremes uh, that we see here in the southeast, and this is just about A to Z, uh, just about anything you could think about: uh, flooding, droughts, um, extreme cold, heat waves, uh, heavy snow, uh, ice storms, of course hurricanes, uh, tornadoes. And then we're going to look at severe storms. Uh, we can look at high winds, in particular large hail, and also uh, frequent uh, cloud-to-ground lightning. So just to kind of start things off, uh, this is a, a slide uh, produced by the National Climate Data Center, NCDC in Asheville, and it shows the number of billion-dollar uh, weather and climate disasters from 1980 to present. And so I've outlined there the, uh, the, 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 the National Climate Assessment Southeast region. You can see 
but that's pretty much square in the center of the part of the country that sees the greatest number of big, uh, big disasters. I don't have time to go into exactly how they figure this out, but if you go in, in and you look at these disasters, as you can imagine, a lot of these are connected either directly or indirectly uh, with hurricanes. And so the southeast, as you know, is extremely vulnerable uh, to that type of, of extreme weather. If we look at fatalities uh, across the southeast connected with extreme events, what really stands out at first glance is hurricanes followed by tornadoes, flooding, and et cetera. But one thing is with hurricanes, the vast majority of the uh, fatalities were actually due to Hurricane Katrina. Okay, and so we take a look here at the, um, at, at, at the proportion here. The vast majority of the hurricane deaths okay, we're connected with Katrina. And so if you take Katrina away, there are really very few, uh, very few deaths with hurricanes. And of course, that has to do with um, much improved warnings, coastal evacuations, and so forth. Not nearly as many people die from hurricanes as, uh, as was the case in the past. So then really what stands out then is tornadoes uh, in the southeast. And I'll say more about that um, a bit later. Oops, I didn't Okay, so starting off here, let's just take a look at some basic variables here. Uh, precipitation, this is a, a time series of average annual precipitation. This is averaged out over the entire region. And what really stands out there is that there's a lot of variability over the last 100 plus years, okay, but no real trend, okay, and that's something uh, that, that's going to come out when we look at some of these other uh, extremes as well. We see a lot of interannual variability. There's also some decadal scale variability, but no, uh, basically no long-term uh, trend uh, there in precipitation. We look at precipitation extremes, however. Uh, this is a plot here uh, constructed by uh, Ken Kunkel uh, at the National Climate Data Center. I, I don't have time to explain exactly what this index, uh, exactly what it is, but it's a good measure there of the, of the number of, of extreme precipitation events uh, as a function of time. And what we generally see, again, we see a lot of variability, and we also see really some interdecadal variability. We see that there was a, a real dearth of events early in the 20th century, uh, and there's been a, a, an increase, a long-term increase uh, since that time. So while there hasn't been, uh, an, over the entire region, an increase in the annual precipitation totals, it appears that there's a higher proportion of that that's fallen uh, that, that falls uh, uh, rapidly. So, so uh, more, basically more precipitation um, extremes there. <clears throat> and so just some examples of that uh, uh, relatively recently. So about two years ago, uh, major flooding that occurred uh, in Tennessee, an area there uh, received about um, $1.5 billion worth of damage, on, um, over 30 deaths in Tennessee, Kentucky, and Mississippi. So that's just one example of an extreme event here. And this event, and, and I think this is pretty common in the southeast, you have really two types of flooding. The rain comes down very quickly, and so you have flash flooding. But also the precipitation typically falls over a broad area, and so that leads to river flooding. And so major streams really flood. And so very two different types of floods there. And that was certainly also the case uh, with Hurricane Floyd in 1999. And so you can see in the map over there extraordinary amounts of precipitation in eastern North Carolina uh, and, and uh, southeastern Virginia going, basically going up uh, into the northeastern U.S. And just a third example, this occurred a year ago, some of you might remember this, uh, tremendous amounts of rain that occurred uh, in the middle part of the Mississippi River Valley, uh, Missouri, and, uh, and actually also parts of the Ohio River Valley. And so all that flood water went down through the Mississippi River and so there were flood conditions down uh, in the lower Mississippi. And so uh, I know Louisiana in particular, low-lying areas were really hit hard here. And so there's on the order of uh, two to two to four billion dollars of damage uh, there uh, in that event. Oops, oops, sorry. Hit the wrong button there, apologies. Okay, so on the other extreme, we have droughts. And, and, and really the droughts that are significant, I think, in the southeast, certainly in terms of agriculture, we can have short-term droughts. But what really yields uh, big impacts are these hydrological droughts. And so these are really strongly tied to uh, low groundwater levels and, and low uh, base stream flows. So we go through extended periods of time on the order of months, and in some cases years, in which we have precipitation deficits. And so that leads to 
Uh, that leads there again to low uh, levels of groundwater and also um, uh, base stream flow. And of course, in terms of forestry and so forth, obviously uh, trees are not going to um, grow quite as quickly and they're going to be prone to, to all kinds of things there. It's very interesting, though, when we look at the trends of, of, of hydrological drought uh, over time, you know, it's very hard there to see the, the scale there on the bottom, but this is basically the beginning of the 20th century. So this is basically the last 100 years. And the height of the bar there sort of indicates the intensity of droughts. And so I just pulled a, uh, up a couple of places on the southeast. And you can see that uh, in um, both Kentucky and Florida, there, have been, there were extreme droughts in the past, and this was particularly evident in the first half of the 20th century. Very big droughts. And in some ways, and of course, you can, defend, uh, you can um, define droughts different ways, but no matter how you define it, there were some very extreme droughts that occurred in the first half of the 20th century. And it's apparent there that there really isn't, hasn't been any trend uh, in, the, uh, in the frequency or the intensity of droughts. And it almost appears that there is a bit of, there is a, bit of a cycle there. Just to show you two other locations in the southeast, uh, North Carolina, you can see a, a more well-defined cycle there where you had where you had quite a few droughts there on the first part of the 20th century. There was a lull in the middle to late part of the 20th century, and then it really picked up again to a lesser extent. You see that's the case uh, in Alabama as well. But again, the, I think the underlying message here is there really hasn't been any, any long-term trend here. But one thing about drought is, again, you can define drought different ways, and drought has, has a lot to do, too, with you know, what sort of sector we're talking about. In the, in the summer of 2007, um, conditions got to be really dry, particularly towards the end of the summer of 2007 going into the fall. And what's interesting is that early in 2007, we basically had normal precipitation. Everything appeared to be fine in terms of reservoir levels and all that. But as we went into the summer, it got dry, and there were very high levels of evapotranspiration. It, uh, the last half of the summer was extraordinarily hot. And so there are areas that went into very deep uh, hydrological drought uh, in a very rapid, uh, very rapid fashion. Okay, so these, these droughts can creep up pretty quickly. They almost always develop uh, in the summer and can and continue on into the fall. And of course, a lot of it has to do uh, typically with uh, recharge, you know, with winter rains. But, but again, sometimes in the, uh, in the spring and the summer, we don't get much rain. Uh, that, can certain, that can lead to these hydrological droughts. Okay, so moving on to temperature here. Temperature, we do uh, see some trends. But the trends are kind of shorter run. We see a bit of a warming from 1895 uh, up to the mi middle part of the 20th century. That was a relatively warm period. Then there was a abrupt period of cooling. Again, a lot of interannual variability there, but cooling going into the 1970s and even early 1980s, it was relatively cool. And then there's been really marked warming since then. But, but the southeast, though, really stands out compared to other parts of the country and the world and that over the last 100 years, there really hasn't been any warming over the last 100 years. So, so again, the long-term trend, the long-term trend there, uh, uh, there really isn't much. Now, one thing you can probably appreciate is, is that the trend really depends on the period that you look at. So we went back another 50 years or 100 years, this might look a bit different. If they only had records going back over the last 50 or 60 years, you know, we very much say that there's been a positive trend there in temperature. So that's something to bear in mind. And also, too, we can, you know, we could speak a lot about what might be behind this, but certainly land use change plays a role that where thermometers are located or where people are, where there are human activities, and so there have been changes in the landscape. And so that certainly uh, has, has played some role here. And there's a number of hypotheses, working hypotheses, about what's going on here. And I'll be happy to entertain some questions about that um, uh, after, after the presentation. Well, let's look at the extremes, uh, extreme cold air outbreaks. Again, I don't have time to go into the index here. But extreme cold air outbreaks have shown really a lot of variability on decadal time scales, but generally in the long run, the intensity of the most extreme events has, has, uh, has gone down a bit. So we can see there the highest spikes there uh, at the end of the 19th century. We've had some you know, really extreme cold air outbreaks going through the 20th century, but really since we've gone into the 21st century, the only years that really stand out uh, was the, the winter of 09-10 uh, uh, and also the, the winter of 10-11. And so those were exceedingly cold winters. But uh, and how, in terms of how these cold waves are defined here, they didn't quite stack up with some of the extremely cold winters that we had uh, in the late 1970s and 80s and also winters that we had 
uh, uh, going back early early into the 20th uh, century there. So so anyway, a, a bit of a, a long-term downward trend. Now again, a caveat here is this is for the entire region. This isn't necessarily the case for Florida. So in Florida, um, there, I don't think there has been a trend, and, and if anything, if you look at parts of Florida, perhaps there's been a slight, uh, there's been a slight upward trend. Looking at heat waves, kind of a similar story here. There's a lot of variability over time, but of course it was, it was very dry in the early part of the 20th century, and that certainly correlates in the summertime with um, above normal temperatures. And so we had some, some really extreme heat waves in the early part of the 20th century. There was a real lull in heat waves in the middle part of the 20th century going into the 1970s. And then things have sort of picked up there again. But, but again, really no, no long-term trend there uh, in terms of heat. If, if anything, if you had to put a trend on it, you'd say there's been a slight uh, downward trend. Okay, so moving on to um, heavy snowfall. Um, what I, I show here, of course, is the plot of average annual snowfall. And you see that in, in the region there, the, uh, of course, snowfall only occurs in about the northern uh, third of the region. And you look there at the precipitation uh, uh, or the amount of snow that we get per year. Most areas, it isn't very much. And there's an incredible amount of variability from one year to the next. So as you can appreciate in the southeast, we can go for a number of years without hardly any snow. And then we have one winter where we get a lot. So it's sort of, um, you know, um, feast or famine uh, in terms of snowfall here. Okay, ice storms, um, map there sort of shows where we see the highest frequency of ice storms. We see quite a few, the Piedmont of Virginia going into uh, the Carolinas there, particularly the upstate of South Carolina and also northeast Georgia. Another region there, of course, uh, over there in Arkansas. And uh, ice storms, if you look at the bottom plot there, have shown a lot of variability. This, is real, this trend here is just really over the last 60 years, so 1950 going uh, almost up to present there. And uh, in this plot that I pulled down here, this uh, is really for two areas that are part of the, uh, of the southeast region there. Okay, but what we see there, and I guess the point that I want to make is, there really hasn't been any long-term trend in the frequency of ice storms. And just some examples, um, of, of one of the most extreme ice storms occurred here in North Carolina in December of 2002. So you see there in that map of North Carolina, there was a, a, a large swath. Basically, it was over the most populated areas of North Carolina. So basically, from just north of Charlotte through parts of the Triad and also the Triangle, but a broad area there that got more than a half an inch of ice accretion, and in some places there got a whole inch. And so there were a tremendous number of downed trees, and I know loblolly pines were were hit especially uh, hard here uh, in this ice storm. Okay, so moving on here to hurricanes. Of course, we know the, the impacts of hurricanes. Uh, storm surge produces a lot of coastal flooding. The strong winds are very significant. And I think, too, from a, certainly from a forestry perspective, when hurricanes move inland, strong hurricanes move inland, uh, there can be just in, incredible amounts of, of downed trees and so forth. Um, so anyway, so as I pointed out earlier, hurricanes uh, have a big have a big impact in the southeast uh, in terms of econ uh, economic damage and so forth. This slide here shows the return period, so the, tip, so the average number of years uh, that a hurricane strikes an area. And the red areas there show the, uh, the shortest return periods, five to seven years. And what stands out there are basically areas that jut out um, uh, into the open water. So South Florida and also North Carolina, particularly Cape Hatteras, uh, there that really juts out. And then you see another area there uh, along the Gulf Coast there, particularly along Louisiana. So those are the areas that get hit the most frequently. It's kind of interesting, that area there in Georgia, the, the return period there is on the order of 10 to 11 years. It's almost twice the return period what we see in North Carolina and South Florida. So of course that has to do with the fact that it's tucked in a bit. There is, a, from, from talking with people, there is a sense of complacency down there. There's a sense that they don't get major hurricanes uh, but that's not, that's not necessarily the case. Okay, so uh, this here just shows a, a ranking of, of uh, tropical cyclones, which is the name that meteorologists give to tropical storms and hurricanes. The ranking uh, in terms of damage costs, and you can see Katrina up there at the top, what really stands out here is that you can see that most of them that cause the most damage have occurred in recent years. And this is, um, I don't know if this has been adjusted for inflation, so that might be part of it, but I think a, a really big part of this 
doesn't have to do with any increase in the frequency of hurricanes necessarily, but it has to do with the fact that tremendous numbers of people uh, have moved into the southeastern U.S. Along, along the coastlines, particularly Florida. And so there's just a lot more infrastructure along the coast than what there used to be. So here's a map here showing the number of hurricane strikes uh, on the U.S. Uh, by decade. And of course, the vast majority of these have occurred uh, in the southeastern U.S. And what we see is a very well-defined cycle here. So if we go back to the early part of the 20th century, we saw relatively fewer, and, we, and then we basically came through a peak uh, in the 1930s to the 1950s, a real down period there, 1960s, really into the, um, the, at least the first half of the 1990s. And then there's been a really big pickup since then. Well, this cycle here uh, is very much correlated uh, with the Atlantic multi-decadal oscillation. So, so there's this long-term uh, cycle in sea surface temperatures in the Atlantic. And so when the Atlantic's a bit warmer, averaging out over long time periods means that more, uh, more hurricanes basically develop. And so there's a lot of debate that's been going on uh, in the uh, tropical cyclone community about, about trends. And, and one thing that's very difficult to determine is just what was the exact number of hurricanes in the Atlantic going back to the early part of the 20th century and prior to that. A lot of small storms were never detected. And so there's been a lot of work done there. But I think the bottom line, though, when you look at the U.S. coast, is there's really not been any long-term trend uh, over the last 100-plus uh, years. Okay, so moving over to tornadoes. The southeast is exceptionally vulnerable to tornadoes. Um, what we have here is uh, uh, different, cl uh, basically, climate regions across uh, North Carolina. And where you see the oranges or the yellows, and especially the oranges, those are the climate, uh, or the, I'm sorry, the counties uh, that get hit the most frequently. And so what you generally see is the areas of Arkansas, Mississippi, uh, and Alabama, Louisiana are, are hit quite frequently, and also parts of Florida. And these basically, these are tornadoes that are strong tornadoes that cause the lion's share of damage and loss of life. These are uh, F2 or EF2 tornadoes on stronger. This is the time series going from 1950 up through 2010. The southeast is especially vulnerable because there's a lot of substandard housing, in other words, mobile homes. Also in the southeast, compared to other parts of the country, there are lots of trees and there's other materials that are hurled through the air. So a lot of the damage caused by tornadoes and loss of life and so forth is not the tornado itself, per se, but, but rather the damage or the um, material uh, that gets flung around at a very uh, rapid speed. Another, uh, another uh, problem in the southeast is the fact that a lot of the tornadoes are difficult to see. Of course, there's many trees, so in a lot of cases, uh, you can't see the sky like you can see in the Great Plains. But also, the supercells that produce these storms tend to have low clouds. Oftentimes, they're at least partly uh, wrapped in rain. So these are very difficult to see, and so that makes them especially dangerous. And lastly, a lot of these occur in major tornado outbreaks uh, in the spring, and they occur they can occur at night, uh, so people uh, can't see them uh, there as well. So here's a, a, a time series showing the frequency of uh, F2 and EF2 tornadoes and greater in the southeastern U.S., and this is a record from 1950 to present. We don't look at EF zeros and EF1 tornadoes, the weak tornadoes, because there's a very strong bias in the record. So in recent years, we've detected virtually every single one of those small, small and weak tornadoes. But in the first half of the time period here, uh, relatively few of those were detected. So if we look at these stronger tornadoes, that gives us a, a more, a better measure, an un, a relatively unbiased measure of the number that have occurred uh, per year. But what we see here basically is that there's really no long-term trend. There was a period there in the mid-1970s, you might remember the super, uh, um, the super outbreak of tornadoes in April 1974. That was a really prolific period there in the mid-1970s. Uh, and uh, but, but again, no real trend. The year 2011 was really extraordinary in the southeast and more broadly across the country. And so we had 166 of these uh, major tornadoes. And so that was uh, greater, by far greater than any year uh, that occurred in the past. And a huge question that I've been asked is, is that part of a trend? And my quick answer is no. And, and I think you can appreciate that by looking at the plot. It would be very interesting to see what, uh, how many we see this year and the years to come. And if we start to see more and more, then maybe you could start to point to a trend. But in terms of what we have now, you can't say that there's any trend. Just an example here. So this is the, um, the really infamous uh, April 2000 um, 
southeast uh, super outbreak of tornadoes in Alabama was hit incredibly hard, 237 fatalities in Alabama out of the 317 uh, fatalities uh, total uh, in this outbreak. And we've done some work at the, at the Southeast Regional Climate Center on this, and we've determined this outbreak was almost as strong as the 1974 uh, super outbreak of tornadoes. Okay, so uh, severe thunderstorms. Um, I think the biggest concern there is, is the damaging winds, uh, which bring down trees and so forth. Um, and also, we've got hail. Um, so the plot here basically shows a hail frequency. And there's a lot of variability. And, and much of this variability, quite frankly, relates to population density. So if you know your geography of the southeast well, you see that populated areas tend to show higher uh, frequencies of hail reports. So there is a bias here. However, if you look carefully, there are areas in Arkansas and Louisiana uh, and that aren't that populated that show high numbers. And so I think generally what you can say is you, as you move towards the west, uh, hail frequencies tend to go up. I, I think there's also a bit of a secondary maximum uh, in, the, in the Carolinas there. Okay, and then our lightning here, uh, the, the, the map over on the right shows the, the flash density, so the number of cloud to ground lightning strikes per year on average. This is through a, a, a lightning detection network. Uh, so I think this is a really good estimate. It shows the frequency of storms that produce frequent lightning. And so, of course, Florida really stands out there. Uh, coastal areas of uh, South Carolina and along the Gulf Coast area and going up into the Mississippi River Valley. You see, you see probably fewer flashes uh, in the Appalachian Mountains. So, that, so the, um, uh, the, the, the electricalness of storms there isn't quite as great. They don't see as many thunderstorms uh, up in that area. Okay, so let's move on here to future projections of climate in the southeast. And so there's a couple of points that I want to make before I show you a few of these projections. And I think these points here are very important, uh, really caveats to keep in mind. One here is that the projected changes uh, in the southeast are not as great as those observed in other parts of the world. And so what this really suggests then is that past climate variability and weather extremes serve as a good analog. So when you're thinking towards the future about what might happen, one basic saying in climatology is if something has happened before, it most definitely can happen again. And so it's very useful then to go back and look at extremes that have happened in the past and think about what those would look like in terms of uh, your sector. Uh, and I think that, that probably is a, that's a pragmatic approach there, but I think that's, that's very useful. Secondly, uh, when you look at the model projections, there's lots of caveats with the model. And so, so really, when we're looking at the model projections, these are not forecasts. These are scenarios. Okay? And so just these are, these are things to think about. These are things that could happen. Okay? They're, they're not necessarily, you can't put a high confidence on any given scenario happening but it's something that you can't rule out. Okay? When we look at scenarios across different models, we see quite a bit of variability. However, there are some places where the models agree. And so that's something that I'm going to try to emphasize in the few slides that I show here. And I think you know, the bottom line here is that we must acknowledge the possibility of big changes happening. Okay? And one, one thing that I tell my students uh, every year is uh, when I teach a class, I say, you know, the more I learn, the more I realize I don't know. Uh, the atmosphere is an incredibly complex system, and the models that we use, the general circulation models, they're incredibly sophisticated. They're getting better and better, and we're learning things from these models. But, the, but there are lots of uh, there are lots of caveats there, and there there are processes that are not well understood. And unfortunately, one part that's especially not understood is air-sea interactions. And uh, we we you've all heard of uh, El Nino and La Nina, and that has to do with sea surface temperature anomalies in the equatorial Pacific. As I understand it, the models, to this point, the general circulation models, can't really reproduce that. And of course, that's a major source of climate variability uh, in parts of the southeastern U.S. And so there are other major circulations, including North Atlantic Oscillation, that have to do at least a little bit with uh, air-sea interactions and with things going on in the Arctic. And we're just starting to really understand those those, uh, those surface atmosphere interactions. And so I think in the future the models will get better, but again, lots of caveats around uh, these projections. Okay, so looking at precipitation projections, and I don't have time to go into details here of this particular model, but these are, these are some of the graphics uh, uh, that we put in our, uh, in our climate chapter here. So if we look here at, at, per, uh, at precipitation projections, what we generally see uh, in terms of precipitation is increases 
uh, except really in, in um, Louisiana and Arkansas, and also uh, there in South in South Florida. So much of the region would show some increase in precipitation. But I must say here, there are a lot of variability. Some there are some models that say that it might get drier. Other models say it might it'll get somewhat wetter. There really is a lot of variability here. And so this is kind of cutting it down through the middle. And I guess um, if you look at it, though, you know, more than half the models do show uh, the northeastern parts of the region getting getting wetter. And so that's one reason that I show that here. Uh, if we focus in on the summer, and this is really significant because we know. Um, um, you know, that evapotranspiration would be fairly great in the summertime. We see that there's little change uh, in the summer, and really when we couple that with temperature increases, which is something we have more confidence in, then that really suggests that we might have more drought, uh, more drought uh, as we go uh, into the future. Okay, so if we just focus on heavy rainfall, uh, the models uh, are, are more in agreement that there's going to be a higher frequency of heavy rainfall and this was especially shown to be the case uh, up in Virginia, North Carolina, Tennessee, uh, and Kentucky. Okay, so more, so basically more of an increase here. And what we're seeing here is the difference, the model projections, uh, 2041 to 2070, and subtracting out uh, 1971 to 2000. Okay, and so you can see an increase on the order of one and a half to two days there in those uh, in those dark green areas. Okay, so here's temperature projections. Um, and um, basically what we see here, of course, is a warming. And there's, you know, this is certainly the field that we have the most confidence in, and that would make sense. Uh, the the, the um, temperatures on a global scale are warming up, and the models continue to show uh, warming, uh, warming uh, in the southeastern U.S. And so that would certainly suggest more uh, evapotranspiration, which means more water stress. Maybe what's of more concern here is that these increases are especially uh, seen in the summertime. So so basically, looking there at the at the uh, map there on the bottom left, there's where we see the greatest uh, increases there uh, in temperature. Okay, so that is so that's certainly uh, something there that's concerning. And so, of course, that's going to be highly correlated with heat waves. Uh, this plot here shows the frequency of days in which the temperature exceeds 95 degrees. Again, this is the 2041 to 2070 period minus the reference period 1971. 2000. We see the greatest changes uh, in South Florida, but generally over the southern and western parts of the region. Now, one caveat I want to give here with this plot is those areas, of course, are the warmest areas in the southeastern U.S., and so those are places in the summertime where temperatures are most frequently around 95. And so it, it makes sense then that you're going to see more of an increase there in the frequency of 95 degree days in those areas. That doesn't mean then that other areas aren't going to warm up as much. It just means that those areas are already quite warm, and they're going to get a little bit warmer. And so there's, of course, real sensitivity to temperature there. So those areas that are that are especially warm getting a little warmer, uh, you know, there could be there could be more certainly more uh, impacts uh, as a result of that. Okay, and uh, so just mentioning here about droughts, I brought it up several times. I think the bottom line is there's uh, much uncertainty with respect to the future trend. But one thing I think you can say with confidence is our vulnerability is increasing due to population growth, um, among uh, other things. Um, I think drought, too, you know, drought incorporates not just precipitation, but also temperature. And the southeast, quite frankly, is just, it's, it's especially complicated in a climate, from a climate perspective, because we have the Gulf of Mexico to our south, the Atlantic Ocean to our east. And so, you know, we can get lots of water vapor and hence precipitation from different directions. And so I think that that's really the geography there is, is sort of what's behind that uncertainty. In terms of air quality, certainly increases in ground level ozone, so more sunshine hours, warmer temperatures, so that certainly correlates with more ozone. I think a point to make here too is that in terms of future projections, a lot of this really depends upon future projections of emissions. Okay, so emission scenarios are really key here, especially when you go beyond 50 years. Now, hurricanes, um, tropical cyclones, there's, again, there's a lot of debate going on right now, but if you look at all the literature and so forth as a climatologist, I think, you know, one thing I think a lot of climatologists would agree with, there's de definitely some real uncertainty, but, but probably what's more likely, perhaps, is slightly fewer tropical storms and hurricanes overall, but perhaps more strong hurricanes. That would be hurricanes that are Cat 3 to Cat 5. 
And I guess in short, the reason for that would be is that, that the models, all the models show warming of the, of the sea surface. So of course that means more energy to build stronger hurricanes. However, one, uh, another factor that you need to make hurricanes is a lack of wind shear, a lack of change in wind speed and direction going through the, through the atmospheric column uh, in the areas in which hurricanes develop. Well, quite a few of the, um, of the general circulation models suggest that wind shear will increase uh, as, um, as, as, we put, as we put more uh, CO2 into the atmosphere. So more wind shear would mean then that there would be hurricanes would be inhibited from developing. But one thing we know about wind shear in these areas is there's a lot of interannual variability. So even if wind shear goes up, there are going to be years in which there's relatively little wind shear. And that coupled with the fact that you have a warmer ocean means that you can make uh, more, uh, more stronger hurricanes. So, so anyway, in short, that's, that's sort of the physical reasoning behind that, uh, that particular scenario. Okay, and I'm just going to put this up here quickly. Uh, I'm not an expert in sea level rise, but this just shows projections of sea level rise here, um, starting off 1990 and going through 2100. I think one thing that I w really want to emphasize here is this envelope is very large. Okay, so there's a lot of uncertainty in terms of how much rise. And one thing this model uh, here shows, and this uh, particular plot here shows, uh, is um, okay. So one thing this shows here basically is that you see here this um, this sort of violet area here. So this is the amount of sea level rise that pro that's projected just basically on the thermal expansion of the ocean. So as the ocean gets warmer, it literally rises up slightly. Okay, And then above this is additional contributions from ice sheet dynamic processes. So in other words, how much the, uh, the continental ice sheets will melt. And there's, there's a tremendous amount of uncertainty surrounding this right here. Okay, I mean, there's certainly more confidence. We know the ocean's expanding because the, cli the global climate is warming up. But we really don't know a whole lot about these very complicated uh, systems here. And so anyway, that's kind of the wild card. And sometimes what I've, I've told people when you're looking at this is to consider this as an envelope. And there is maybe almost an equal probability perhaps of getting th a three foot sea level rise as getting a one foot sea level rise. But again, there's a lot, of, a lot of uncertainty surrounding this. And another aspect of this again has to do basically uh, with the emission scenarios. So if we see continue to see strong increases uh, and CO2 emissions, and certainly you could uh, you could move this um, you could move this uh, upward um, a bit. Okay, so that completes my presentation. I just want to thank uh, Chris Furman and Maggie Kovac uh, from the Southeast Regional Climate Center, and also Ryan Boyles and Ashley Frazier from the North Carolina Climate Office. Uh, they were responsible for putting together uh, some of the graphics you've seen here, and also uh, quite a few of the graphics uh, that went into this uh, climate uh, chapter. So thank you very much.